don't worry. Right, good morning everybody. Lovely to see everybody here. Oh, so, so excited Sue, love to see you here as well. And we are kicking off in eight seconds time, which is so, so exciting. Thank you so much everyone for giving up their rather gray Saturday to be with us. It is lovely to have everybody here. And as I said, really appreciate everybody giving up their day to come and join us. Okay, so our third Healthy Horse Conference starts in literally a couple of minutes and I am really delighted to be welcoming everybody here. So many thanks for joining us. What I would like to do to kick us off is just run through a little bit of housekeeping and then I will introduce you to our first speaker of the day. So as you know, if you've joined in my online training before, you'll know I'm really sociable and I love to feel like it's in the room as much as possible. You know, it's, we can't necessarily bring everybody together from all around the world, which you've got people participating from all over the world, but let's use the chat. Let's be as sociable as we can be. So where are you joining us? Put it in the chat. Are you on the tea? Are you on the coffee? Is it later? Is it super early and you're still in bed in your pajamas? Let me know. I would absolutely love to know where you're joining us from the world and how your Saturday is starting so far. So a couple of little housekeeping bits before I introduce our first speaker for the day. Hey, Sarah in Essex. Is it tea? Is it coffee? Is it maybe hot chocolate? Is it something else? 
I'm going for a very healthy vegetable juice this morning, which hopefully is going to make my, my voice hold for the day. So yeah, I'd love to know where everybody is and what they're up to. So housekeeping, a couple of requests. If we could please ask you to stay muted, that would be fantastic. It just really helps the quality of the playback if it's just like two voices. If we can't understand your question and put your questions in the chat, if we need more information, we will invite you to talk. But if you could stay muted, that really makes for a much better uh, experience for everybody on the catch up. Now, I love questions. I love asking questions and I love everybody to be really involved. So please do stick your questions in the chat as we are going along. There's honestly, there's no such thing as a silly question. And the massive advantage of not being in person is doing it on Zoom is that everybody can just shove a question in as we're going. It doesn't matter if it, get if it gets answered. And for anything like me, you write it down when you're listening to a live talk to ask at the end and then you don't always remember, or if you're anything like me, your handwriting's so poorly, you can't always read it back. So use the chat, honestly, get stuck into the chat. If you could um, prefix your questions with a cue, just to make it super obvious to me and my lovely assistant, Miri, that would be great. If you find we haven't answered your question or asked your question and got it answered for you, please just remind us, like it's nothing personal, but very occasionally one might slip through the net. So please, if we've missed your question, tell us. As I said, it's nothing personal at all. I'd rather you told us again and we got it answered. So that's our kind of housekeeping bit. How the day is going to work, hopefully, is every speaker has an hour. They will talk for around 45 minutes. And then we've left 15 minutes to answer any questions and also give you guys a few seconds to make another cup of tea, have a comfort break. So throughout the morning, the talks will start on the hour. Okay, that is the plan. And I'm sure it'll go very swimmingly. We've done lots of online trainers always goes to plan. Okay, so as I said, we've got time for questions. Please ask lots of questions. We really would love you to do that. And I think the main thing I would like as a request is that you take action after today. Like we've put a load of effort in, we've got these amazing speakers. They've produced these fantastic talks to help horses. And that's really what I'd love you to do is make sure you take some action after today because let's face it, we've all done it listen to something, oh, wow, that was amazing. Write all the notes, don't, don't change. Don't make any changes in our lives. Now, and I've got a mixture of owners and professionals. You all have the chance to take the learnings from today, to take this information and make a change. Make a change for better with the horses that either you own, you care for, you interact with. So let's use today as a massive force for good. We've got so much you can do with this information. We are looking at healthy horses from all sorts of angles. So that's my only request. It's okay to request, enjoy the day and do something with the information. That is what I would really, really like from you all. That would be absolutely fantastic. Okay, I will stop talking and I will introduce our first speaker. I saw Sue a second ago, so I'm sure Sue is gonna magically reappear in just a tick. So Dr. Sue Dyson probably needs no introduction, which I think all of you joining us. Sue has spoken on lots of my uh, courses before, training events before, and this is the third time she's joined us at the conference. I'm Sue, I'm so, so delighted you're joining us again. To me, Sue has really transformed how we see naughty horses, because there's a very strong chance they're not naughty, isn't there? And I feel that her work has really given horses such a voice particularly the ridden horse ethogram. To me, that was a massive game changer. And when I first learned about the ridden horse ethogram, I was riding a horse for a client and it just was starting to display some of these things. And it just helped validate and kind of give a sort of scientific basis to the fact that I had this feeling in my tummy that the source wasn't quite right, but it's really hard to put it into words. Also, when you're not a vet, it's very hard to say, oh, well, I don't think everything's quite right here. So for me, Sue's work has been an absolute game changer. Sue, I know owners and professionals around the world are grateful, and I think horses everywhere must be extremely grateful for the amazing work that you have done. And today, it's all about dressage horses. So I'm gonna find Sue, I'm gonna hand over to Sue, and we'll, ah, 
I said it would just be like magic, didn't I? There we go. I need to find Sue's video box and then we will start. Sue, how are you today? Are you well? I'm in good form, yes, thank you very much. Brilliant. I just need to make myself disappear and your, your face appear. That's my only thing I can't seem to do. Why can't I do that? Right, um, let's just move me over. Ah, is it that one I need to press? Do, 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 do. Well, hopefully Mary can do that because I can't see you, Sue. I can see your screen. <laughs> I can't, I can see me, not yours, not you, which isn't quite right. Why is that? Um, what did I say about tech being so amazing? Right, Sue, so we'll let you start and I will find a way to get that to change because that is feeling beyond my tech skills at this particular second. Um, is it gallery? Ah, perfect. There we go. Let's have you there. There we go. In your rightful place, Sue. Right. Thank you so much, Sue. I will hand over to you. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to talk to you all this morning. Um, to ask the question, could dressage performances be improved? And I'm going to present to you some work which is based on observations from both national and international competitions. But first of all, to set the scene, uh, we've got a technic another technical problem, the screen won't advance. I will stop sharing. Um, yeah, that normally sorts it, doesn't it? Well, it's a lovely image just to, for us to be viewing to start with. <laughs> I always like it when Sue presents because she's got such a nice horsey picture behind her. I always like seeing that. Turning on, turning off always seems to fix things. Sometimes there's a slight time delay, isn't there? Aha. So I think that we have to be very conscious that all equestrian sports are in the focus of the welfareists. Pictures such as blue tongue, hyperflexion, are very much um, projected by those <laughs> who don't want us to ride horses in competitive sports. There's a noseband lobby. There is the bitless lobby. The people for ethical use of horses is against the use of equestrians in Olympic level sport. The FEI is producing a ban on marshmallow fluff or the use of white foam around the mouth to obscure potentially mouth opening. We have to be very conscious of this. Now, I wouldn't profess to be an expert dressage rider, but I have had the privilege of riding some upper level horses. And this is a photograph of myself uh, in a German newspaper entitled The English Amazon. I've always felt the need as a veterinarian to fully understand the problems experienced by dressage horses. And in order to do that, I have to know exactly how they should move and how they should move correctly. So for those of you who know nothing about the ridden horse pain ethogram, the ridden horse pain ethogram is a series of 24 behaviors, each of which have strict definitions. For example, ears behind the vertical position for five seconds or more, the mouth being open with separation of the teeth for 10 seconds or more. The majority of these 24 behaviors we have demonstrated are at least 10 times more likely to be seen in a horse with musculoskeletal pain than a non-lame horse. And a ridden horse pain ethogram score of eight or more indicates that it is very highly likely that the horse has some musculoskeletal discomfort. We have also shown that at five star three day events, the ridden horse pain ethogram score was related to performance. So those horses which scored seven or more out of 24 during the warm up for the dressage phase, compared with those horses which scored less than seven, had higher dressage penalties were approximately two times more likely to be eliminated or retire cross country. And those horses that finished had lower finish places. We applied the ridden horse pain ethogram to elite dressage horses competing in World Cup Grand Prix competitions. 
our aim was to apply the ridden horse pinnithogram to all horses competing at seven World Cup qualifying competitions in the Western League and two World Cup finals. And we hypothesized that this should be a group of horses with a low incidence of musculoskeletal pain because they were elite athletes uh, competing at the pinnacle of their careers. Thus, the ridden horse pain ethogram scores would be consistently less than eight. We had a number of additional aims. We wanted to compare the ridden horse pain ethogram scores with the percentage scores which were awarded by the judges. We also wanted to determine the frequency of occurrence of each of the abnormal behaviors and to compare these and other observations with the guidelines for judging at FEI level dressage. We wanted to provide additional evidence that the ridden horse pain ethogram can be used to differentiate horses with and without musculoskeletal pain when ridden. And an important thing to support the social license to compete in dressage, provide evidence that at elite level, the majority of dressage horses are comfortable in their work. We also, far ranging study this, wanted to provide data that may be useful for the training of dressage judges, trainers, and coaches. And by providing evidence on a large number of horses working at elite level, places in a better position to educate owners, trainers, judges, veterinarians, and other equine professionals about the value and the power of the ridden horse pain ethogram. So the video footage was acquired professionally and was available on Horse and Country TV or on YouTube. It was acquired in a standardized me method and there were 150 competitors, two of which were eliminated because of the presence of blood in the mouth and one through the presence of continuous lameness. The ridden horse pain ethogram was applied in real time during the first viewing of the video recordings. The video recordings were subsequently re-evaluated in order to assess the correctness of performance of some movements, which I had the impression were being performed rather poorly by some competitors. And these included the piaf, the passage, the extended walk, and the movement halt, immobility, rein back five steps, and proceed at collected trot. 147 competitors completed the test, of which 10% showed transient, mild, full and lameness in either half pass, extended trot, or passage. 12% of the horses showed either unilateral or bilateral hind limb toe drag in passage or extended trot. And this may be a reflection of a low grade lameness. 6% showed variable temporal and spatial separation of the hind limbs in the sequence flying changes. The most frequent ridden horse pain ethogram score was only three out of 24. The middle 50% of horses scored between one and four. Overall, the range was zero to seven. In this graph on the right, we can see that the judge's good points are on the vertical axis and the ridden horse pain ethogram score is on the horizontal axis. There was a moderate, negative correlation between the ridden horse pain ethogram score and the judges scores, which means that the higher the ridden horse pain ethogram score was, the, the lower good marks awarded by the judges. So we can see that the majority of horses which scored 75% uh, or more, the highest being 84%, 
had low ridden horse paniogram scores. There was one outlier, a horse which scored 82%, which had a ridden horse pain ethogram score of five. So this indicates that the horses with the higher ridden horse pain ethogram scores were judged to be performing more poorly than those with low ridden horse pain ethogram scores. What about the behaviors that were exhibited of the ridden horse pain ethogram? 68% of the horses demonstrated mouth opening with separation of the teeth for at least 10 seconds on at least one occasion through the test and in some horses throughout the test. The head was behind a vertical position for at least, at least 10 degrees for at least 10 seconds duration in 67% of the horses, as we see in the photograph on the right. 30% exhibited an intense stare or glazed expression in the eye for at least five seconds. 29% showed repeated tail swishing, which was not observed to be in association with a spur cue. An additional 36% showed repeated tail swishing, which appeared to be in synchrony with spur cues. The deviations from the FEI guidelines for correctness of specific movements were most frequent in passage, piaf, canter flying changes, canter pirouettes, and the movement halt, immobility, rein back five steps, and proceed in collected trot immediately. 62% had gait abnormalities in passage and or PF. In passage, the most common features that we noted were almost simultaneous placement of the hind limbs to the ground, as we see in the lower photograph. This was often associated with an increased tendency for the horse to have the head behind a vertical position, as we see in the top photograph. We also saw a high frequency of occurrence of an intense stare and the ears back, as we see in the lower photograph. In PF, the most common abnormalities were an irregular rhythm, reduced hind limb flexion, so that the foot either did not come off the ground or was lifted only slightly or just elevated the heel of the foot leaving a toe of a hind foot on the ground with or without a double beat, bringing both hind limbs under the trunk with increased slope of the thoracolumbar sacral region, or bringing both the forelimbs back and the hind limbs forward under the trunk. So in the lower photograph, we can see that the hind limbs are being brought abnormally far underneath the trunk. The forelimbs are back, so the horse has a base narrow uh, position and the head is behind the vertical position with about the third cervical vertebra being the highest point of the neck. Some horses were never able to perform correct steps. Why might this be so? It may relate to an inability to learn how to sustain static equilibrium and balance while lifting a pair, of hind, a pair of limbs. This could be compounded by a lack of musculoskeletal strength and coordination. But remember, these are elite level horses who are at the pinnacle of their careers. Fatigue could play a role or discomfort or a combination thereof. And the fact that there was an increased tendency for the ears to be back the, uh, the exhibit, exhibition of an intense stare and the head being behind the vertical makes me think that an element of discomfort may play a role. Let's consider flying changes. At the initiation of the change, the new hind limb bears weight alone. So in this photograph, the horse is changing 
from um, uh, right lead canter to left lead canter. So the new trailing or outside hind limb is the right hind limb and the right hind limb bears weight alone for a significant length of time, which is obviously biomechanically quite stressful. When we looked at the um, problems that were exhibited by horses in the canter flying changes, we saw a prevalence of 20%. And this was related to the horse being croup high, swinging excessively from side to side, missing changes, or showing repeated close temporal and spatial placement of the hind limbs. So if we look at the bottom photograph on the right, we see a horse performing a flying change from left to right. So the left hind limb landed first, and then the right hind limb was placed subsequently with good spatial separation. Contrast this to the photograph on the top, when we have the same horse performing a flying change from front right to left. The right hind limb was unwilling to bear weight alone for a significant length of time. So the left hind limb was placed to the ground early and placed to the ground very close to the right hind limb in order to provide additional support. This could be due to weakness or it could be due to discomfort. The canter pirouettes were abnormal in 12% of the horses. And this was usually characterized by close temporal placement of the hind limbs, which was often associated with the head being considerably behind a vertical position, in contrast to the photographs here in which the pirouettes are being performed correctly. When considering the movement halt, immobility, rein back five steps, proceed at collected trot, the halt was not square in 36% of the competitors. It was not at the marker, but in 17% of the competitors. That surely must reflect rider error. The head was behind a vertical position more than 10 degrees in 63% of the horses. Because the duration of this was generally less than 10 seconds, this would not have been included in the ridden horse painetogram scoring. Likewise, the mouth being open with separation of the teeth was seen in 33%, but as it was in these horses not seen for 10 seconds or more, may not have been included in the ridden horse painetogram score. 23% of the competitors performed a rain back of less or more than five steps. In extended walk, the front of the horse's head is supposed to be in front of a vertical position, but the head was behind a vertical position for more than 10 degrees, for more than three steps in 36% of the competitors. In 6% of the competitors, the head was behind the vertical in extended walk only and not in other movements. The pole was not the highest point of the neck because of the development of the crest of the neck in 10% of the horses. And this was associated in the majority with obesity. This is a major problem in my perspective. The good thing from this study was that the most frequent ridden heat horse pain ethogram score was only three out of 24 which is good for the social license to compete. Moreover, 50% of the horses had scores between one and four. No horse had a score of eight. And when we looked at the spectrum of behaviors shown by these horses, it was a much narrower spectrum compared with those horses which we see as lame horses consistently. It was interesting that the high frequency of occurrence of the head behind the vertical was often accentuated in movements that the horse found biomechanically more challenging, such as rein back, passage, piaf, the one-time flying changes, and the canter pirouettes. Moreover, the behaviors of the ears being back and an intense stare 
were only seen during passage and PF in some horses. The FEI rules state that being behind the bit demonstrates lack of submission. For extended walk, the athlete allows the horse to stretch out the head and neck forward and downwards without losing contact with the mouth and control of the pole. The nose must be clearly in front of the vertical. The FEI rules also state that tail agitation should influence the score for each movement in which the behavior is score as observed. The re repeated tail swishing is one of the ridden horse paleogram behaviors and was observed in 29% of the horses. A further 36% of horses showed repeated tail swishing in synchrony with spur cues. This could perhaps be interpreted as conflict behavior. When we consider how the judges were marking, I think it's interesting to look at the sequence of four movements, passage, transitions between passage, piaf and passage, piaf, followed by passage, bearing in mind that the PF has a coefficient of two, so there are double marks for the PF. This movement occurs three times in the Grand Prix test, representing 150 marks, which is 33% of the total of the possible marks. Yet, there were horses with clear abnormalities in passage and PF, irregular gaits, with the head behind the vertical and the mouth opening, which overall scored more than 70% in the test, equating to fairly good. Moreover, there was consistency among the judges, but it seems to me that this is not following the FEI guidelines for the movement. Pammy Hutton, in a recent article in Horse and Hound, commented, dressage judging really should become more honest even if it does mean dramatically altered results. Mouth opening with separation of the teeth was seen in 68% of the competitors, which compares with only with 44% of non-lame sports horses in a previous study, and also 44% of five-star three-day event horses. However, the FEI rules for dressage do not specifically mention mouth opening. They do, however, say that the degree of submission, which is equated with obedience, is demonstrated by the way the horse accepts the bit with light and soft contact and a supple pole. I ask you, does this look like a soft and light contact? I suspect that the high frequency of, of occurrence of the head being behind a vertical position seen in 67% of the competitors, is likely to reflect in part the horse's training. And I think that we have to think about this and the consequences of this from a biomechanical perspective, what it does to the range of motion of the thoracolumbar sacral region, and thus to the development of the muscles of the back, how it influences hind limb engagement and impulsion, and how it potentially can induce the increased risk of injury. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But now I want to compare those elite horses with what I shall call sub elite horses. And these were horses competing at the Hickstead Rotterdam Grand Prix Challenge and the British Dressage Grand Prix National Championships in 2020. These were video recorded and available for public viewing. At the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge, there were 38 competitors performing their tests either in Rotterdam or at Hickstead. The median ridden horse pain ethogram score, that's the most frequent score, was four out of 24. The middle 50% of competitors had a score between three and six with a range of zero to eight. At the British Dressage Championships, there were 26 competitors and the most frequent score was six out of 24. The middle 50% scored between four and seven with a higher range of between one and nine. 
in association with these higher ridden horse pain ethogram scores, we saw a higher frequency of nameless and abnormalities of canter compared with the World Cup horses. This graph shows the total ridden horse pain ethogram score on the vertical axis and the three competitions, British Dressage on the left, the Hickson Rotterdam Challenge in the middle and the World Cup on the right. And we can see based on the p-values, which were all very low, that there were significant differences with the British dressage scores being higher than both the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge and the World Cup, and the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge being higher than the World Cup. So these were statistically significant differences. When we look at the incidence of specific behaviours, we can see that an intense stare was observed in only 30% of horses at the World Cup but nearly double that of the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge, 55%, and more than double, 77% at the British Dressage Championships. Similarly, there was a much higher frequency of tail swishing at the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge and the British Dressage Championships, 53% and 81% respectively, compared with only 29% at the World Cup. The frequency of hind limb toe drag was considerably higher at the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge and the British Dressage Championships, 26 and 35% respectively, compared with only 7% at the World Cup. The tongue being out was three times more prevalent or more at the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge and the British Dressage Championships compared with the World Cup. And the presence of a crooked tail, which we know is associated can be associated with lameness, was seen in a much higher percentage, 23% at the British Dressage Championships, compared with only 1% at the World Cup. This graph shows the correlation between the judges' score and the ridden horse pain ethogram scores at the British Dressage Championships. We can see that compared to the World Cup horses, the scores were, were much lower. Um, with only one horse above 80% and the majority being in the 70s or 60s. But again, we can see a negative correlation between the ridden horse pain ethogram score and the judges scores. So those horses with the highest ridden horse pain ethogram scores had the lowest judges scores. Let's look at the correctness of the more difficult movements. So if we look at Passage and Piaf, this was performed incorrectly in 62% of the World Cup horses compared with 81% of the horses at the British Dressage Championships. Incorrect flying changes were seen in double the proportion of horses at the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge and the British Dressage Championships compared with the World Cup. Similarly, there was a much higher percentage of horses, 29 and 32% respectively, having abnormalities of canter pirouette at the Hickstead Rotterdam Challenge and the British Dressage Championships compared with the World Cup at only 12%. The movement, halt, immobility, rein back five steps, proceed at collected trot, also performed more poorly at the sub-elite level. 54% of the competitors showing mouth open with separation of the teeth compared with 33% at the World Cup. Lack of diagonal steps observed in 12% of the World Cup horses, but 25% of the horses at sub elite level. And the rein back being crooked in only 6% of the World Cup horses, but 15% of the sub elite horses. Interestingly, when we look at errors that I think may reflect training or rider errors, there were no significant differences between the elite and the non-elite competitors. So the halt not being at the marker, the halt not square, the halt not sustained, and an incorrect number of steps in rain back was shown by, with very similar frequency in the elite compared with the non-elite horses. So I think that both these studies have shown that for with respect to social license, the most frequent scores of the ridden horse pain ethogram are low. And that supports the use 
of, a, of horses in elite dressage and sub elite dressage. However, I think it was a little disturbing to see the higher frequency of occurrence of lameness and abnormalities with encounter in the non elite horses, which I think are likely to reflect discomfort. I believe that if we recognize that those horses may be experiencing discomfort and they underwent appropriate investigation and treatment, then we could enhance both their welfare and their performance, which would be a win win situation for everybody. I think that there are various aspects that need to be considered in more depth, including training methods, education of judges and trainers, to ask why major errors are not appropriately penalized, for example, head behind vertical, mouth opening, repeated tail swishing, and why are so many movements not performed according to FEI guidelines, but yet are rewarded by good marks. Understanding the biomechanical consequences of incorrect training, I think, is very important. This horse, you can see the forelimb uh, forearm is at a much uh, larger angle than the hind cannon region. These should be parallel. And we often see this in exuberantly moving horses, which are worked with their head behind the vertical, with the mid neck as the highest point of the neck. See also that this horse has the bit pulled through to one side. This horse is really poorly muscled in the lumbar region. And I think that this is a reflection of the way in which this horse has been worked. And I think is going to have potentially long-term consequences for this horse's ultimate soundness. Another comment from Pammy, Pammy Hutton. And how long before head behind the vertical is routinely marked down? A very good question in my opinion. Why is there such a high frequency of repeated tail swishing and why isn't it marked down? Does it reflect the horse's underlying discomfort? Is there a conflict between spur cues and rein cues? This needs to be addressed. Pammy Hutton also said, and what mark does one give a horse that double beats a bit in Piaf? Six at most as suggested by the judge's examination or maybe a, a four as referenced in the FEI judges guidelines. This is clearly something that needs, in my opinion, to be addressed. I asked the question, is there an influence on the use of a double bridle? Let's look at the incidence of mouth opening with separation of the teeth for more than 10 seconds. I have evaluated 1,010 horses performing dressage tests at BE90, 100 and novice level, and the frequency of mouth opening with separation of the teeth was only 35%, which compares with 44% of horses competing at five-star three-day event level, 68% of the World Cup Grand Prix horses, and 81% of the sub-elite Grand Prix dressage horses. This needs to be investigated, I believe. The FEI guidelines actually say that the main contact should be with the snaffle rein. However, if the rider presents the test with the curb rein hanging completely loose, a deduction of one point should be made in the marks for submission and rider's position. I do believe that harmony and lightness do get rewarded. I think the right horses, generally speaking, do finish up on top. I have to ask the question, how much of what we see is the influence of the rider? This to me is not a particularly pretty sight with the rider's upper body being leaning back, her lower leg being drawn up, uh, having a strong contact with the rein, front of the horse's head being behind a vertical position. You may be asking, does this matter to lower level riders? Well, in a study in which we took a convenient sample of UK sports and leisure horses in full work and presumed by their riders to be working comfortably, we had 25 horses, which were dressage horses competing from novice to advanced level. And their median ridden horse pain score was sadly nine. 
the top 50%, the middle 50% scored between five and 10. Moreover, there was a positive association between the ridden horse palethogram score and lameness observed either in hand or ridden. So this would indicate that in the general equine population of horses working at lower levels in dressage, we have a higher prevalence of horses working uncomfortably. I mentioned my observations of 1,010 horses competing at BE Novice 190 level. The most frequent ridden horse pain ethogram score was four with a range of zero to 12. However, when we looked at the final placings of the horses in the entire competition, those that were placed first, second or third had lower uh, ridden horse pain ethogram scores with the most frequent being two and the range being only zero to eight. So we once again saw a high prevalence of head behind the vertical, the mouth being open, and what we saw with a disturbingly high frequency of occurrence was lack of a suspension phase in trot and often in canter as well. There was a very high prevalence of lack of hind limb impulsion and engagement and canter lacking suspension. So that we can see in the top photograph, the horse has got, almost got all four feet on the ground at once at trot, so there's no suspension phase. Likewise, in the lower photograph, there is no suspension phase in the canter with the trailing hind limb and the leading forelimb both on the ground simultaneously. So why was it so rare to see suspension in these horses competing at lower levels? Why is Rainback performed so badly at these lower levels as well as at elite level? Why do so many horses not perform free walk on a long rein correctly? So my question at the start of the talk was, could dressage performances be improved? And I think the simple answer is yes. And I think that this involves a team approach. Everybody who is involved with the horse, the role of the rider, the trainer and the judges, the role of the saddle fitter to provide correct saddle fit for both horse and rider. In the photograph on the left, the back of the saddle is bouncing up and down that reflects poor saddle fit. And then obviously the other veterinarians and the other paraprofessionals involved in the care of the horse. I think that with a better understanding of the correct principles of training, which does not include head being behind the vertical position for prolonged periods of time, we would prolong longevity and soundness of horses. And I think that riders, trainers and coaches have to be very much aware of this. The consequences of incorrect training are that the horse will fail to develop adequately the lumbar musculature. It will fail to push adequately from behind. It may develop hind limb gait asymmetries or a bilateral hind limb lameness. So I think that correct training will enhance quality of performance, will improve longevity of performance, and also increase the likelihood of sustained soundness. I think we have to recognize the influence of rider weight distribution their balance and the rider's coordination. This rider is sitting on the back of the saddle. The lower leg is too far forward, so there is not a straight line between the rider's shoulder, hip and heel. So the rider is inevitably out of balance with the movement of the horse. The horse's neck frame is too short and look at the poor development of the lumbar muscles behind the saddle. I think we need a concerted effort to improve riders' positions, which I am sure can have the potential to improve dressage performances. I think it is also important that we learn how to recognize the behaviors that may indicate the presence of musculoskeletal pain. 
such as tail swishing, the mouth being open with separation of the teeth, an intense stare, the ears being back behind a vertical position, the head being tilted. Note also this rider's position, the uneven level of her hands, her lower leg being too far forward. I think that we could improve training. For example, we could improve the performance of rain back by practicing movements with help from the ground. In the 1,010 competitors I saw riding British eventing tests, in almost every section, at least one person went wrong, performed an error of course, and one person actually went wrong three times and was eliminated. So you can improve your performance by knowing the test and riding the test accurately. Bear in mind that data that I showed you about the halt being in the, in the incorrect position and the halt not being square. Surely those are things that should be easily correctable. Look where you're going. So your line from A to C is straight and be aware of the weight of your head and how your head being looking down can influence the horse's movement. And I would make a plea to ride forwards. It was interesting to me that in the novice tests which involved some medium canter, we often saw a suspension phase in the medium canter, which was completely absent in the working canter. I think that we have to encourage judges to judge what they see. This horse is being ridden by an elite professional rider. The head was behind the vertical position with the mouth open with separation of the teeth throughout the test. Yet the dressage penalties awarded were, were only 23.5. And this horse finished up winning the section. This surely cannot be correct. So my take home messages are, I think we need to take prospective action to protect our equine sports. And I think that the data that I showed you today, by and large, does show you that the majority of competition horses at whatever level are performing with a low ridden horse pain beneath the ground score which justifies the social license to compete. But I do believe that there are many factors which could be utilized to improve performance and improve equine welfare. So on that note, I would like to thank my major collaborator, Dee Pollard, and also to thank NKC Equestrian Training for the opportunity to present this morning and I would be happy to answer any questions. Oh, Sue, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And I don't know about everybody else, certainly lots of things that really, really surprised me. I have to say, yeah, quite a few surprises came up. And um, we have got a couple of questions, which I will dive into. Um, and then I've got a list of my own questions as well to ask you, see. But yeah, one of the questions that came in was, would you say that the FEI terminology, with everything focused on obedience, needs a bit of an update, needs modernising? That's not a favourite expression of mine. Um, if we could see more focus on harmony, team. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you actually purchase, which is quite expensive, the FEI guidelines for judges, the, the word harmony does come in quite a few times, but if you just read the basic rules, it doesn't come in very much. I think obedience is better than submission because submission in, has a completely different connotation. But yes, I think harmony, lightness, athleticism are things that I would like to promote, which I think we see in the very, very good horses. But if we go down a little bit, we don't see so much of that. Yeah, definitely. I've always had a real problem with the word submission. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's wrong. wrong. It's inappropriate. I really do. And I think that that really does need, you know, you've talked so well about the social license. And um, I think we really just need to wake up, don't we? And I just love um, Pammy Hutton. I, I think she's absolutely brilliant. She, I love the way she challenges things. And it was great to hear some of her points that she's been in Horse and Hand with recently in your, in your talk. So it was fab. 
a couple of other questions I had jotted down. I mean, you're great. You answered lots of them as you're going along. But I think one thing that really struck out is how can people not realise at that level, those riders, they surely they know what they're doing. The trainers, like they have so much help and support. There should be quite a good team around. How is all this missed? And do you think there's anything we can do? You know, because it can be hard when you're just literally watching, you know, to make it a bit more objective, you know, like videoing, slow-mo, watching it back. What, what can be done? It is just a question, I think, of raising awareness. Um, I, I, I must say I was surprised when I embarked on this, the level of, for example, tail switching, which was extraordinarily high. And I think people have just become kind of accustomed to it. And they don't really look with their eyes and see and kind of think about what they're observing. And when something becomes so commonplace, everybody accepts it as normal um, when it shouldn't be normal. I mean, the, the, the frequency of occurrence of the mouth being wide open such that you have separation of the teeth to me is um, one of the biggest issues that we need to address. And whether or not the FEI's ban on um, colouring substances about the mouth will make people more aware of the occurrence of this, I, I, I don't know. Um, but I think it is something that needs to be addressed. And I'm surprised that I, I, I have a, a, attended British dressage conventions. I have um, never really heard these things come up in discussion. Um, and even at the British Dressage Convention last year, which was um, video recorded, there was lots of talk about, oh, the horse needs more encouragement to go and stronger leg aids as a response to which the horse switched its tail more, but nobody challenged, well, is this right that we're having to use stronger leg aids and therefore the horse is switching its tail more? Um, there doesn't seem to be a, a connection be to me between the fact that some of these horses may have some low grade discomfort that could be addressed with the improvement in both gait quality and the comfort of the horse and the scores for the horse. Uh, so I, I think like Pammy, I think there needs to be a bit of a, 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 a shake up and a, a raising of awareness. Mm, I totally agree. And and now you've highlighted so many people just are sitting so incorrectly and they're putting all this time and effort and money in but with some going back to basics of it they'd be getting so much further forward and you know and, and some people don't like to be told that how they ride their horse isn't as effective or as as good as it could be and I think it's time that people just took it on the chin really I, I totally agree I think a shake-up is required one thing I did want to raise is the obesity now that leads beautifully into our next talk Sue so thank you so much for, for streamlining the day perfectly there but I have to say that surprised me because at the lower levels, yes, you hear people going, look at this amazing top line. And you're like, no, that's fat. Your horse does not have a well-muscled neck. It is a beast. But I was yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty prevalent among dressage horses at, at across the levels. Mm. Um, and I, I think it's become a, a vogue. In saying that, I well remember years ago competing at the Winter Dressage Championships with an event horse and feeling that my horse looked skeletal compared with all the dressage horses. Uh, but I thought my horse was a fit, lean, uh, good athlete. Um, but just to go back on rider position, um, I do think this is a big issue. I do think that perhaps when I watch people being trained, which I do quite a lot, I'm often fascinated that not enough attention is paid to rider position. There's a lot said about Oh, uh, use more inside leg, uh, raise your right hand, etc. But not about the basics of the position of the body. Mm. And when you look at our elite like riders, so you, you look at Charlotte Dujardin. I mean, she is beautiful in the way that she sits, and she can sit and look effortless. But I know she puts a huge amount of work into her physical fitness. And I think that perhaps physical fitness also is something which there is not enough attention paid to. So that in order to sit correctly, as Charlotte does, it needs a lot of core muscle strength. And that means probably for some riders also doing some work off the horse as well as on the horse. Mm. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And actually, as soon as she said that, my stomach muscles contracted. Um, yeah, I, I think we do need to be treating ourselves, even at the lower levels, as athletes training you know it doesn't need to be hours you could just be doing 10 minutes a day off the horse and it would make such a difference with consistency Kate's put a great um question in should we not be thinking about what we're asking horses to do if we're creating discomfort it's a great point is it is the horse like not able to do what we're asking and that's why they are showing signs of discomfort or they're not comfortable in the first place it's a difficult one to tell it is a difficult one yes because I think movements such as um, PF in particular is biomechanically very demanding and highlights any, I use the term weakness or discomfort um, and brings it to the fore because of the way the horse is loading the limbs. And therefore, I think that unless the horse is 100% okay, it's going to struggle because it is such a biomechanically difficult movement and it is repeated several times during the test. And obviously the horse has been warmed up and probably practiced it too. So the horse has got to be fit. Um, one could ask, are all these horses as fit as they could be if they are carrying additional weight and they're perhaps not um, as ultimately as fit as they possibly could be, maybe that is a contributing factor too. When you look at riders' diaries in terms of what their horses do on a day-to-day -day basis, in many instances, they spend too long in a stable and not enough time either being exercised in a positive way or freely moving around in a field, mm. uh, which to me is beneficial for musculoskeletal strength and coordination. And for a dressage horse, even if it's only at walk, to walk up and down hills or across hills, I think is good for musculoskeletal strength coordinate and coordination, which will facilitate the performance of some of these more difficult movements. And perhaps also what pole work could also, by separating the diagonals, um, improve performances. Yeah, definitely. And I know you've talked before about how you'd like to see horses out of the school and cross trained, not on an actual cross train, but yeah, doing doing different work. I think that's so, so critical. I'd love to ask your thoughts on rain back and free walk on a long rain, because having taught really low level, but for years and years and years, people have always found this hard. Um, and I don't think the horses necessarily find it that difficult. Is it the riders struggle with those movements? They just don't practice them. I feel particularly for your walk on a long rain, is the kind of movement people don't practice at home. They they give the horses a bit of a stretch at the end and then on the test, they're sort of like, oh my goodness, we never practice this properly. That's just my own um, personal experiences of that. But what are your thoughts? Like, why are those two movements, the ones where people are, and horses, are finding it so difficult? I, I've, I struggle with this because I've thought about it a lot and, um, having ridden a horse recently when I had to open about 15 gates in re fairly, relatively rapid succession, my, the horse I was riding went backwards very, very well. So it's not that difficult a movement, I don't think. Um, but clearly it is performed badly at all levels, which to me must reflect some inadequacies in the training because it shouldn't be that difficult if it is taught correctly. And that's why I'm suggesting that help from the ground should facilitate correct performance of the movement. And it has to be practiced. Mm. Now, I'm all, I, I hate seeing horses practice something repeatedly badly. So I see horses which find difficulty in doing flying changes and they buck and they, the rider then comes back and does it again and again and again. And I don't think that's productive. But to practice something with progressive improvement is potentially productive. Um, so I think... Practice and help from the ground is the potential solution for the rain back. Um, for the free walk on a long rain, I suspect that there are two features. I think that one, people don't specifically practice it properly. And I think that there is a subset of horses in which the reaction to put their head behind the vertical is some way of relieving pressure somewhere because it's, I've often seen it, having watched so many tests in the last uh, several months, I've often seen it in horses which were pretty uncomfortable in the work prior to that, 
and then they're put on a long rein and they immediately put their head behind the vertical and sometimes sometimes I've seen horses try and bite their chests um, but I do think that it is also a reflection of inadequate practice and training mm. and we can again have an assistant have a have, have some food out in front encourage the horse mm. to stretch forward and down yeah, it's so interesting. It's, it's a movement I've always found really easy to ride and train myself. Um, but yeah, I've seen so many riders really struggle with it. And I wonder if it relates to how you were saying riders need to go forward more. I think so many people are just riding with the, the handbrake on. And I think there is so much fear about letting your horse stretch forward and down and allowing the walk to really open and take riders forward. I wonder if that has a part to play in as well. Yes, I, I think it may do. I mean, my overwhelming impression from the British eventing competitions is lack of forward movement, riders not being positive enough, um, which I was disappointed to see, because that's something which is so easy. Um, and yet, if you see them warm up for the show jumping phase, for example, they ride the horses differently. So they can ride those horses forwards but they seem reluctant to do so, both in the warm-up for the dressage and in the arena itself, because I don't see a great difference between the dressage warm-up and the same horse in the arena. So it's not something that they're just freezing when they get into the arena. It's something about the way they're training that horse on the flat, and they change when it comes to facing a jump. Yeah, that's so interesting. I was just literally going to ask that, like, how do they, how do they cope with the next phase so they can't go forward in the dressage? But it's like there's a different combination when there's events involved. Wow, very interesting. That really is. Um, one comment, when assessing horses as part of a physio assessment, people struggle to get the horse to rein back in hand, let alone on board as a good assessment. Yeah, so that, that does panda. Is it finding it hard because it's uncomfortable or is it just never asked? It's uh, really hard to know. But see, that's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always love hearing you speak. And I just think you and Pally Hutton need to get together. And wow, what a lot of good you could, you could do together. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, I'd love to see.